everybody. We have got Stella Rasmus. Now, Stella's a writer, but she's just the, the first book, yeah? First book? Yes, my first book, my first solo book. First I, solo I, book. Like 20 years ago with the dermatologist. So it was oh, beauty. God. This is no good. This is writing that gets noticed, find your voice, become a better storyteller, get published. And this book, which, when did it drop? When did it actually publish? I'm sorry, I didn't check the yeah, June 13th of okay. this year. So it's been out a little bit, but but it just got added, tell me again, to the NYU, to what is it? Yes, so it just became a course at NYU that is part of the journalism certificate to get at the School of Professional Studies um, in NYU. Congratulations. You got to love that. Now the kids are going to have to read it. They have to read it. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. All right, Estelle. So, but it's been a long journey to this book. Yeah. Uh, but you, it sounds like writing when you were a young person was something you were interested in from pretty, from kind of the, the jump. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always loved writing, but I went into public relations after college. And then from there, I went into magazines because I really liked the other side. When I was in PR, I liked the people that I was serving and I wanted to be on that side. And so when I had an opportunity at, at a woman's world, to be in the beauty department, uh, I took that and never looked back and I loved it. So you were like a uh, chick lit lead character. You're young, you're attractive, you're in New York, you're working at a slick magazine. You were living the life, kind of. I was right? like a brunette back then. <laughs> oh, you were a brunette. Okay, it's a totally different and a so, whole different vibe, yes, but it was, um, you know, the Linda Carter. I had more of a Linda Carter look then, okay. and um, but I, I just loved it. I mean, it was the high flying '90s and early oats, and um, that was kind of a glory day of magazines. I would yeah. say the '90s. Yeah. Um, I would go on press trips. I would go to events. I would go to dinners. I'd have tea at the plaza with uh, Iv Ivanka. No, Ivana Trump, the mother. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, you were right in the thick of it. And you were, but you were, did you get hired on to, just to edit and, or to generate content? What were you doing for the magazine? So I started at Woman's World as an associate beauty editor. Right. But I don't know how it is now, but back then you could move very quickly in publishing once you understood how things worked. And Woman's World was seven deadlines a week. Okay. Cool. Plus, I very shortly got my own beauty column where I worked with the photographer. I I booked the models. I wow. directed the shoots. I got the products in. I was doing everything. Were you writing and the column or just or just I was writing the column. I was oh. interviewing the experts. I was curating the information from the beauty books. And from there, I went in to become a senior editor at American Woman magazine. And from there, I became an editor-in-chief. So I became an editor-in-chief of the competition of American Woman at the time, which was Woman's Own. Okay, wow. So you're just flying up the ranks, ambitious young <laughs> woman. You're learning to write, for one. You know, you're really kind of learning. You know, don't you think the publishing world in the magazine, in this case, the magazine world. I mean, I suppose you could go to journalism school, but the truth is, at publishing, like being an agent, being a writer, to some degree, you just kind of like it's a mentorship. Like you really can't go to law school, like you or all these other schools. It's just you go in, you have a degree in English or whatever you get your degree in, but it's really just liberal arts, and then away you go, right? Yeah, you know, Bill, you know how Malcolm Glad, I think it's Malcolm. Yeah, the 10,000 hour guy. The 10,000 hours. I put my 10,000 hours in, right? I yeah. learned how to write fast. I wrote copy. I wrote short copy, which is now perfect for the, the web. Yeah. Um, I learned how to get my deadlines in and get all the answers that I needed, like the, the five, 
five W's that we learned, who, what, when, where, why, and also how. And um, I made sure to uh, tell a narrative story as well when I needed to, because that's what got the reader's interest. So it was really a boot camp for writing and writing as it happens today, which is a much shorter form than yeah. it even was then. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when I started writing, I started for author magazine, which you'll be in and contributing to. I'm looking forward to that. I started writing a daily column. I, for a while, I did one essay a day, but my whole thing was before I really knew anything about it was I said, I, I want it to be social. I want it to be 400 words so that it can appear on your screen and that you'll see beginning to end. You'll see the end as you look. I, I don't know why I had that vision, but I've come to love that that 400 word limit I put on myself or 450, you know, in there was great. It taught me so much about storytelling and writing and just saying what you needed to get something across. Very it's, effective training. You don't have to do the throat clearing, which right. is all the prefacing of yes, something yes. to the point. Get them hooked. That's yeah. what it's all about. Get their attention, get noticed. And you know, well, yeah. And well, and there's a story, you've mentioned story and I write a lot of stories. I tend to do personal essay, but I found that in all, it was funny because we were talking about Fearless Writing, which was the book I wrote a few years ago. And someone had written to me once about it and said, oh, thank you for writing this story. Now, that is, it is not a story in the tra traditional sense and that it's a book about dealing with the emotional challenges of writing. But I always thought of it as a story and where there was a challenge and a kind of a resolution. And I think, don't I mean, don't you think every piece we write has some element of an arc of a problem resolution, problem resolution, even if it's not a, you know, character going through a problem? Yes, I do. I think that you... A, have to set up why the reader is going to care, right. whether you're writing an essay, whether you're writing an article, whether you're writing uh, a, a hybrid reported essay, which is an essay with reported elements like yeah. statistics and polls and studies and quotes. Yeah. And you still have to set up that. And uh, with an essay, there's some sort of a conflict usually that ends up in a transformation. Yes. And whether it's internal or external, there is something happening. Why? Because that's what the reader is going to be interested in. A lot of people, and I've talked to so many editors also for my, my podcast, Freelance Writing Direct, where I talk to editors and best-selling authors like Cheryl Strait and Ann Hood, and I'm hoping to have you on the program. Please. <laughs> And I love having writing teachers in the program. <laughs> wow. And so I, you know, the the idea is to make sure that the reader is reading a compelling story that's gonna take them along. And you do that by painting a picture, almost yeah. like a movie with yeah. sensory. I, I call it sensual language, but it's not like oh. sexual. No, but it has to be absolutely see, see, taste, smell, feel. It's all there. It's got to be there. I tell my students, I'm like, put me there. In fact, you know what's interesting? Sometimes my students will say, I don't know. I got to write about this time and place. I don't remember anything. And I say, just put yourself at the dinner table. Just describe what you were, and you will see as you describe the salt shaker and suddenly, oh, there's right. There was that painting there. And then my father said that thing. And so suddenly you're back in it. But sometimes just describing what the physical world, I'll do that. I'll just say, yeah. let me just be there for a moment and remember what it's like. And then other stuff comes back. I love that. And my students, when they ask me, I have students for Writer's Digest and NYU and also um, for my one-on-one -on -one coaching, and they'll ask me, I have writer's block, you know, what do I do? <laughs> and in my book, I give like 20 scientifically proven things to beat writer's block. But I'll also say, if you're trying to write a scene, just write a sentence, one sentence of yes. something. Yes, yes the place and describe the room Descri put a piece of dialogue just slice it up in little you know baloney bits and then yeah. you can put it together it's As so a true and also i i tell my clients i'm like look and my students i say sometimes like i want to get in i want inspiration i do i want to have that moment and i have it in every piece where something surprising happens oh now i'm excited now i'm really but i don't start there usually but I like to write. So if I just let, like you said, exactly like you said, 
I write a sentence and that's kind of intellectually interesting. And now I'm a little more interested than I was before I wrote the sentence. Now I want to know what comes out and just allow myself to gently get into the story one sentence at a time, knowing that something better is coming, some little surprise, particularly in the personal essay, maybe a little less in informational stuff because it, you're kind of, you're just giving information to some degree, but particularly in the personal essay, I'm always looking for that moment of, oh, now I know why I'm writing it. Now I know what's exciting about this. Yeah, and I want to make also the point, and this was what I started to say before, but I don't think I finished, <laughs> is Oops have said to me, you know, everyone wants to write about this sad thing happened to me, my divorce, somebody right. getting sick, but that does not make a story in and of itself. No. Because that mm -hmm. does not engage the reader. There has to be a universal where did you cut where did you go that's from it that's right what can you learn from it what can you share that you learned from it right. where is and i use the word transformation where is that transformation and that is what a lot of people especially beginner writers don't understand it, it is want to write their anecdote <laughs> that's right and i will tell you i found a career as it because really it's i'm so glad to have you on because personal essay is really what i write that's what i write short pieces and so on and where i realized i liked doing it was when i when i knew early on that i understood the importance of endings that it was all about the ending where do you leave them where do you leave them otherwise it's just a little journey you know what's funny i use i had this first observation. I don't know if you've ever gone through this, but I used to read the Atlantic Monthly. Loved the Atlantic Monthly. I was a big, div but I would, sometimes I'd read these big 5,000, 6,000 word es uh, essays about some problem with the world. And then in the last paragraph, they'd say, so we should do something about that. And I'm like, look, you just, <laughs> you can't just give me the problem. Like I don't need 5,000 words of a problem. I need as much energy in the solution, whatever that may be. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's almost like they're setting it up like a, a, an op-ed because an op-ed is a call to action, you know, yes, what you, yes. but you also give information on what you're going to do as well. I had an excerpt in Jane Friedman's newsletter from my Ooh. book on op-eds. Yes, right. it, did, it was the best. I think it was that she puts most popular post of the month and that was the most popular. Nice. Post the I felt really, you know, it's a lot of nice affirmation for me. Sure. <laughs> Sure. All right. So writing that gets noticed is this is for our essay writing listeners, but you cover everything. You cover the personal essay, the op-ed, the, well, really anything that is between probably what, 500 and 2000 words, kind of 2,500 words, that general length. Yes. Would I would think the short, shorter writing, you know, right. I, I do cover a little bit long for, form in terms of essays, but right. in general, it's the shorter writing either for magazines or for online publications. It's not, I'm not covering books. Although I feel that a lot of the tenets that I talk about, especially when it comes to craft can be used for oh, books. Totally, well. totally, totally. And I, it's particularly relevant now when I started teaching personal essay, I looked up and realized, well, God, that's mostly what people are writing in the blogosphere is just whether they call it that or not there's so much essay writing happening this book this magazines this print magazines of course and they pay well <laughs> which is nice but there's people writing in this form so so good for you to really focus on it and but this is what you did so because you left the publishing where well, you had a baby yeah all right you got to start <laughs> raising a family and then you decide to get back into the world but really as a writer and not just as an editor yeah. and were you a little intimidated by that? Were you like, I so was. you had a column, so, but still. I was because um, I, I was dealing with infertility in midlife and my right. daughter's 14 now. Congrats. And, <laughs> and I had her in my 40s. Wow. And so I, uh, and I also got married in my 40s. So like I had a big life transition. And while I was dealing with infertility, I mean, in publishing, the old days of publishing, I don't know how it is now, but when we were in an office, you would stay till nine at night. You would go to dinner right. somewhere, right. you would stay till night, you'd come home, and you would start again the next morning, which is great for a single person, but not so great for somebody, A, dealing with infertility, somebody who's, you know, married and trying to build a relationship and not yeah. just 
out and back. So anyway, I, I made had to make some choices and I was able to segue as I pivoted so often in my life and, and I share that a lot in my, my writing is that I went into medical education, which is a very different field. However, I learned so much there about how to read PubMed, how to find studies, how to how to assess and analyze and pick the best studies, which now is so paramount in writing health and science for publications. Sure. And it really did help me a lot when I started writing health writing. So I would say that, and I share a lot of that in the book because it's not only for people who want to write essays it's people who want to write articles and don't right. even understand right. how to begin there and yeah. don't understand how to interview experts where to find experts how to vet experts how to find the research that's not going to be proprietary or that's not going to be research that you can't use because it's some company and you're not checking and finding out that it's a pharma company right. which means your editor won't allow it because it's not it's it's not impartial so there's so many elements and I try to really break it down in my book so that you can understand the reader can understand and just use it you know my whole premise of teaching is you give someone a fish, you feed them for the night, you teach them how to fish, That's and right. they can feed themselves for the yeah. rest of their lives. That's and right. That is the reason that I wrote this book. That is so you really I mean it's a book, but you wrote it from a place of service. Is that is that yeah, that it's service, but it's also my life. I shared stories from my life. You did, I, mean, I know. I, I was the dating diva. <laughs> I taught about relationships and dating at the seminar center, you know, and, and I, I also wrote a tiny love story for the New York times on that, but you know, it's something that I wanted people to see. I, I, I had a journey and I had a lot of pivots and I yep. never gave up. Yeah. And when I went into blogging, that was the other part that we were talking about. So for medical education, then I had my daughter and I decided to raise her from home and figure out what I was going to do. And I uh, auditioned for a column for Patch, which was Patch AOL. And I got a mom's talk column, which didn't pay a lot, but it, it kept my skin in the game. In sure. my new game, in the parenting game. And then I decided, um, I, I wrote my first personal essay that was my voice. It wasn't like a journalistic reporting piece, right. what I had done before, even as a magazine editor-in-chief. And so I ended up um, hearing of one of these places that did uh, like vocal, it was sort of like on, on stage, like the moth, but it was called yeah. Listen to Your Mother. And it was the voice <laughs> of motherhood. And so I ended up auditioning and I didn't even say, oh, I used to be an editor in chief seven years ago because it I, it felt so in the past. Yeah. I just, I'm a former communications professional. And I got in based on my audition of my piece that I wrote of my daughter dancing in the library and how it made me think of my hopes and my fears and my dreams for her and for my future. And um, I said, you know, can I ever be like that again, ready and willing to, to take the stage and have the whole world in front of me? Because that's kind of how I felt. Like I'd been sure. on this I'd been on TV, I'd been at the Learning Annex, I'd been on all the shows, and yet I was kind of forgotten now because nobody right. cares. Uh, you know, it's kind of like you're only as good as your last class. That's right. Where are you? They don't care. They're on to the next thing. They're on to the next and thing. So I decided, uh, you know, what are all these people doing and listen to your mother? They were blogging. And I said, what is blogging? And they said, oh, we tell our stories and we talk about our right. kids. And I said, oh, great. What do they pay? They said, oh, they pay nothing. <laughs> 
And I thought, well, I have to try this because I really admired these women. It was Amy Wilson, who was the director, and uh, Abby Sher was in it, and Alicia Rayner, who played Fig in Orange is the New Black. These were the people who were in the show that I was in. Wow. And I thought, if they're doing this thing, I'm going to do this thing. And so I started a blog, Musings on Motherhood and Midlife. And so what happened is um, I ended up saying, I want to get back into publishing. I want to do that. And so my first publication was uh, Marie Claire. And then I pitched the Washington Post. I wrote a piece while we were on vacation about my daughter. I called it my daughter's out of control. And I twisted it around. Instead of blaming her for being out of control, I kind of put the onus on oh, me. I see. It's good. You flipped it. You flipped, flipped it. it good you flipped it you gotta do it good for you and that went viral that piece yeah. went absolutely viral and yeah. led to me writing a dozen articles for the washington post in the parenting and i also wrote health for them that's great and i also had a viral piece on blog her that ended up on yahoo blog her is now defunct but it, or maybe it's not defunct anymore but the site right that, that, a very big thing and uh and then i started i had taught at nyu in the early oats and then i started teaching at nyu again that's it's awesome it kind of came back and even stronger than before and so i felt like i really had something people kept saying to me how are you in all these publications how are you doing it can you teach us and so i started coaching and then started teaching at writer's digest so it all kind of started coming full circle again you like teaching I love teaching. Yeah. I, I received the 2023 Teaching Excellence Award at NYU. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. I That's do. What do you like about it? Well, I am very, I consider myself very inspirational and I like to inspire my students and I like to support them and help them keep their voice, but also learn craft. And sure. as I edit them, and I am big on line editing, as I edit, because for my days as magazine editor, yeah. as I edit them, I tell them why I'm making the changes that I make so that they can learn. And they say my biggest uh, compliment is when they say we have your voice in our head as we're writing as we're, and I'm like great you know as long as it's still your voice on the page but my voice as your editor is perfect I had a client who really she came to me I didn't understand how kind of rough her craft knowledge was so I was doing I tend to do more kind of like almost life coaching with them in a way with a combination with some crap, but she really needed the craft stuff. So we were getting down to nuts and bolts and I was walking through like, why you put this word in and not that. And I hadn't really done that with a lot of the, my clients and students, but I, it was a weird way. I was hearing myself think about my process that I, it was, I was happening so fast in my mind as I wrote, it was incredibly helpful to hear me explain why I made the choice. In other words, I was learning as I taught. I always do. But but even on the basic craft level, I feel like I understand it better when I have to explain. Like I had a student say to me once, I said, look, we're doing memoirs. So you got to put it in scene. Everything's got to be in scene. She said, what's a scene? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I had never thought to even have to describe it. So then I had to figure out how to describe the scene as hell. So that, I don't know, do you run into that where people ask you questions that you had never been asked before? You have to. Oh, yes. I mean, I've had student. I had a student who had been a best-selling uh, author at near IL and he's very well known in the field and he'd always wanted to be in the New York Times but he didn't know how to pitch and he we had a brainstorming session and this was early in the pandemic and he's he came up with a bunch of different ideas I'm like well maybe and then he said what about homeschooling and I have this information I said wait you you have expertise in that he goes yes and I can talk to this person and I know something about this technique and all that and I'm like that's it I said because the New York Times likes to be first they like to be fast I said I nothing has come out yet I said but you have to write this pitch now he said <laughs> I've never written a pitch before I said 
just do what I'm going to tell you to do <laughs> and write it. I will review it. We'll send it out. And I said, and once you send it, I want you to start writing this article. Usually I wouldn't say that. I said, but when they accept it, they're going to want it in about three or four, three days tops. Right, right. And that's exactly what happened. Nice. Oh, what a good coach you are. Wow. <laughs> I am it's so impressed. It feels good to me. You know what I mean? Like, oh, feel good to be able to help people achieve their goals yeah well you said you like you can see yourself inspiring which is great i think there's nothing better in the world than being inspired that feeling it's just such a sense of confidence that comes from it i think but one of the things i love about inspiring people is that i have to get inspired to inspire in other words i have to feel what i'm giving them and i love that feeling anyway so my students the uh, lecture halls, whatever. It's a great excuse for me to tap into the thing I want to tap into all the time. Yes. And, you know, it's fine that you mentioned that because I do take some people on for one-on-one -on -one coaching, but they have to have been my students before. So oh, meaning, okay. I have to have worked with them because I know if that's somebody that I want to continue working with and that I can help and that I can oh, that's work with interesting. in a way that's going to be good for me. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And so that's, so you have a limited, you have, you have a, a small stable of clients, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe you got a bunch. No, I do. I, I mean, I teach a lot of people through Writer's Digest yeah. and through NYU, but then I am selective with the one-on-one -on -one students that I take on. Okay. So you've written a lot of stuff, a lot yes. of periodical length stuff, but if you, do you have a favorite? Do you, ha do you have, of all the kinds of stuff you write, do you have a favorite kind? Well, I used to love, love writing parenting stuff. And now that my daughter is a teenager, yeah, not so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because she doesn't want me to write that stuff and doesn't want to be used in any way. Sure. And I completely understand. So I do love writing about publishing and I love writing my stories of my life with my midlife perspective. Yeah wisdom that I can share and I am working on a memoir and I'm working on a novel so wow. Ooh. Both genres kind of equal working on it's no, depending on what's going on my wow. days are pretty busy with a teenager and an active teaching coaching life and writing life um but I do enjoy that I think memoir by memoir I I, I include in memoir the short personal essay. Because to me, that's that is a sort of short. The, it is to the memoir what the short story is to the novel, essentially, right? It's like the same format, but more or less in a in a smaller package. And I think of memoir as like the cheapest therapy in the world because you have to. You can't. I always tell my students, you can't complain. There aren't any victims. There aren't any villains. Like you can't judge people. You really yeah. have to dial all that stuff out of there. And yeah. it makes you look at your life differently. Like, because you know, if you're because if you're writing short memoir pieces, every time something bad, quote unquote, happens to you, isn't some part of your mind saying, Oh, here's an essay. I can take this is something I can use. I can the use bad stuff is harder to write about. So really, see, example, I don't I find it easier to write the best stuff. I mean, as long as I transform it, as long as I transform it, as you said perspective i feel of being able to emotionally separate yourself to get to the end to see where you're coming out for example i had an ectopic pregnancy that every time i looked at it what i was writing i would cry and i just right, couldn't yeah. get through it yeah. it took me six months one day i woke up i went down and i just like honed what i had written you know the editing part is a different part of the brain than sure. the writing and so and then I was able to and it actually became a blog her voice of the year award winning nice. winner and it was on a site that's now defunct called purple clover but I did manage to get the rights back so that's good <laughs> yes you're right that when you when it's a particularly challenging piece like that you have to have a distance you have to be able to see it as useful as opposed to just a thing that you wish didn't happen it's that thing can't. that happened to you and yeah, you it, it won't work world about it yeah, yeah nobody and nobody. I also find people get 
too scatological. Like I, <laughs> right? I was crying so hard, the snot poured yeah, into yeah, my yeah. face, and I was yeah. swallowing it, yeah. and it was, but and it was like, nah, nah, less is more. <laughs> right. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I was just telling my wife yesterday we were having we were talking, and I said, you know what? Generally speaking, I find people suffering boring. It's not that I, it. We all suffer, but that's not the interesting part. It's what comes after. I say, I get the suffering. We all do it. And I will tell people about my suffering, but much less now than I used to. But it's the after. That's the only interesting part. The suffering itself is usually just us not understanding what's happening a lot of the time. Like, you know, because if you're having the ectopic pregnancy, part of the fear is like, what's happening? Will I be okay? Will I be okay? You don't know at the time it's happening, right? Exactly. And, and it's so funny that you say, will I be okay? You must be psychic because I kind of ended my essay. I don't have it in front of me, but I kind of ended my essay by saying the day that, um, you know, I saw my little, my three-year-old, my daughter, who's now 14, um, eating the bagel and had butter smeared on her lips. And she said, mommy, something. And, you know, I knew it would be okay. I didn't hear, I had heard the voice of my, you know, ghost baby. I call it the ghost baby. Right, right. Getting up the ghost baby. And, um, you know, it was sort of like, that's sort of how I ended. And so the reader knows, you know, she came out of it. She came I, out. I think you, you have to, you have to, otherwise, what's the point? Like, what are you telling me this for? Otherwise, except for me to feel sorry for you. And like, that isn't, and you know what part of the problem is, Estelle, is yeah. that when we talk to people, I always tell my students, like, you've been a memoirist your whole life, but a bad one, probably. Meaning you've told your friends, like, can you believe he did this to me? Can you believe this happened to me? It's a kind of memoir, but it's a bad story. It's just a complaint about a thing that happened. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you write it down. You have yeah. to transform it. Absolutely. Uh, oh, I love talking with people who agree with me. Or <laughs> I agree with it. It's always so much fun. I love okay. talking to people who talk craft. I mean, you talk craft. Oh. We're, we're talking the same language, Bill. <laughs> we are. I, I don't talk to enough essays. I talk to a lot of novelists, a lot of memoirs, but not enough essays. So good. I got another one. It's writing to get enough people. If you want a hands-on, look, she gets into the emotional stuff, but there's a lot of really practical, if you the kind of stuff I don't write about. <laughs> so if you want someone who can really get into the how-to, it's a great book for that. She knows what she's talking about. She walks, she's been on both sides of that editorial line. It's so helpful and it really shows. So she doesn't come at it from just the writers. It's so helpful. So writing that gets noticed, go get it, people. A lot of you are writing blogs and sending out. So go get it. But, but still, I'm not quite done with you. I want you to answer one more question for me. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. If writing, all the writing you've done has taught you anything about life, about being you, it's taught you what? It has taught me that your words matter. You need to tell your stories, but you need to learn craft on how to tell your stories. So learn the craft. Find a way to get the craft under your belt by reading a book, read a book like mine, read a book like yours, and take classes, work with coaches like yourself, like me. And then you can tell your stories in a way that's going to make an impact and that's going to resonate with the reader.